Welcome back to a page from history. It is a hundred years since Indian soldiers were part of the Battle of Nav Chapelle, as we were talking about. This marked a major turn in the war with the British offensive in France for the first time. Rana Chinna, if we actually look at you know, in the recent years, because a lot of research in the, in the wake of you know the, the 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 preparations for the centenary of the First World War, a lot of new revelations have been have come out about about the war in general and also about Indian participation. From the new ma material which has come, the new archives which have been explored, what are the major uh, findings that you would like to share with us? Uh, well, I think to start off, I'd like to uh, point out that yes, uh, I mean, I'm aware we, um, all historians, uh, people who study the First World War, are aware that there were certain criticisms leveled against uh, um, uh, the performance of Indian soldiers right. in the First World War. Um, I do think that a large proportion of them were unfounded. racially biased, right. they were unfounded, um, and they do not stand up to historical scrutiny. Because when you actually look at uh, levels of, uh, uh, say, the casualty figures, whether they were uh, European troops or Indian troops uh, engaged in the same battle, the same mm -hmm. numbers are getting killed. So if the Indians were, were not performing uh, at their optimum, you would expect to see you know, significantly less casualties, but that's not happening. Mm -hmm. So I do think a lot of that, uh, see a lot of that has to do with the fact that uh, uh, the Indian Army was uh, officered by uh, British officers. There were no Indian officers. The British officers were very dedicated. They knew their men. They knew how to speak the language. But you had, uh, as Anirudh pointed out and as Professor Yadav pointed out, an industrial scale of uh, uh, death and destruction being dealt out, where out of battalions of 800 men, 350, 400, 500 men were, we're getting dying. killed on the same day. 80% of their officers were getting killed. Now, they were being replaced by officers who couldn't speak the language. Uh, you, so There you was have absolutely no personal contact with them. They're completely I, in the I mean, more alien than land, that. So, alien so command you, structures. So you are putting in a body of troops that are ill-equipped, uh, ill-clothed, commanded by officers who can't communicate, communicate with, with them. them. And then you expect them to give 100%, which they still do. I would say that actually that 100% amounts mm -hmm. to 200%. They, they did their best and more. The, I don't think any troops in the world could have perhaps True. done better. That was one. The other aspect about, uh, you talked about self-mutilation. Mm -hmm. um, that was... That uh, was one of the allegations. It was one of the allegations. In fact, investigations were conducted by the British. In, investigations were that. conducted uh, at the Royal Pavilion in Brighton. The uh, officer commanding over there was a man mm -hmm. called Colonel Seaton, mm -hmm. who was uh, from the Indian Medical Service. And he actually examined uh, 1,000 cases right. of uh, injuries to the hand mm -hmm. and uh, to the left hand. Uh, specifically, because mm -hmm. it was, uh, they said th that, so they was, were, they that were, was the they allegation. They were hurting with, with the right hand. Well, yeah, that they were, you know, um, uh, inflicting injuries on their left right. hand uh, in order to get out of the thing. And ultimately, uh, after a very systematic inquiry, uh, they his uh, findings of that uh, 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 process were that they were less than two percent of cases which might have been self can be construed to have been uh, been self inflicted self so so that was kind of thrown out even contemporarily mm. now very interesting uh, uh, i just happened the other the other day to actually pick up a book about uh, the indian involvement in the boxer rebellion in china in 1900 mm. and the of, the officer commanding one of the battalions the seventh rajputs he actually makes this point over there. Uh, see what happened on the Western Front? They said it's the way, manner in which the Indians use when they fire, they, they use their left hand to shield their eyes. This was a point which was made by this officer in 1900, and he says mm. the Indian troops in China should actually be provided with the kind of peak cap which the British troops use, and which the, some uh, one of the other troops over there, uh, I think the Persian troops, he say, mm. uh, and you know they kind of tie it around their turban and so on and so forth, and so there is something that's being corroborated um, almost. Mm. 14 years ago by an officer writing in right. China and uh, he's saying that you know the Indians when you're firing a rifle and if you're firing into the sun you have to you have to you, you have, have to, to shield, shield your, your eyes, your eyes yes. and that's where a lot of when they were doing putting and their and that's where they were getting hit when they were putting the their hand above the trenches because otherwise I can just put my rifle and I can fire but when right. I put my hand over there that's going to it's get hit to enemy fire. Yes. Right. So, like so, so that's uh, I mean I was just saying yeah. that you know yeah. it just goes to prove uh, prove one of the points right. 
Anirudh, uh, you know, in terms of new revelations, you know, what does do your findings uh, conclude? You see, if you look at the, uh, if you look at Flanders also, mm. about Flanders also lots of things were said about Indians and so on. But recent research now reveals that the cases of trench foot amongst the Indians mm. were much lesser than the cases of trench foot, let's say, amongst uh, the Scots. For instance, what do you mean by trench foot? Trench foot. This trench foot was a very common uh, mm. problem which occurred in the trenches mm. in Europe when the fi fighting went on. There was trench warfare mm. in Europe in right. the nineteen in 1914, 15, and sixteen when right. troops used to live for entire Days. months, oh. entire months, months, practically entire months, living in the trenches. They would be living, eating, defecating, urinating in the trenches. So the trenches became so a very, 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 uh, very filthy and very filthy unhealthy. And, uh, unhealthy now uh, the European troops the Scots and the British and so on, they were used to wearing shoes the exact size of their feet. Right. And when in cold weather, when the feet became wet and the shoes became tight, the feet would swell up inside the shoes. Right. And uh, that would cause a condition called trench foot, trench foot, trench foot on a large scale. And many cases of so something like you know, uh, you know uh, it used to become a very uh, it it would become a festering fungal kind of infection. Uh, frostbite. Yeah, frostbite yeah, and then it would and and it it would lead to frostbite, and it could lead to and it led to the blocking off of uh, circulation to the lower part of the lower extremities of the limbs, and consequently amputation. Mm. But the Indian practice, the Indian army had this practice of making its troops wear shoes one size loose with two socks, hmm. two pairs of socks and a sh larger size shoe meant that the Indian soldiers had, had space within the space shoe within the, the shoe for, for, circula expand. To, for yeah, circulation, circulation of air and circulation of blood also. The shoe did not become tight on the feet right. because the shoes would be worn with something called the putties, you know, the putties and the, uh, the, and the, 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 and the tight bandages which would be right. worn around the shoe right. and because the bottom is to be very, very tight. So because of this practice of the Indian army, the Indian soldiers sometimes were actually more comfortable living in the trenches mm -hmm. compared with European soldiers and the number of trench foot cases amongst the Indian troops were much less. lower much than lower. the number of trench foot cases amongst the European troops. So it is not as if the Indian army did not have mm -hmm. certain practices uh, which were, you know, which were actually conducive to warfare in Europe. Mm -hmm. The other example is uh, from Mesopotamia. Mm -hmm. In the Mesopotamian campaign, again, the casualties were very high, especially amongst the young British subalterns, young British officers, because the Turks were actually defending uh, extremely protected and extremely well-mounted positions that could, at places like Kutal Amarai and other places where the tru Turks were in you know, fortified strongholds. Mm. And it was often noticed in Mesopotamia that the Gurkhas, again the Marathas were rediscovered in uh, Mesopotamia, the Sikhs, the Rajputs, the Punjabi Muslims. Mm that they showed no fear in actually charging the Turkish positions, taking the positions head on with bayonet, with bullet. Mm. So these were artillery positions, strongly defended artillery positions, which were being rushed by Indian troops. And they would often indulge in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the Turkish soldiers who were known, mm. who were known for their you know, fighting abilities. So this whole, uh, you know, this whole a canard about Indian troops not mm. giving off their best or Indian troops uh, feeling scared under battle or Indian, Indian troops actually feeling completely under fire. Wrong. I think it's, 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 it reeks more of racial right. prejudice than Is that a else. similar kind of finding from, of, uh, you know, uh, uh, that yes, you have found, yes, Professor Yadav? Yes, as uh, Professor uh, uh, Dr. Uh, China has said that uh, you see 2% hmm. say cases maybe Maybe have been uh, said. Uh, are, yes, yes, maybe uh, of uh, such mishaps, you see. Uh, you see, and uh, these were the soldiers, not the actual soldiers. These were the uh, forcibly recruited soldiers from Punjab, for instance. Mm. There is an instance there. They were forcibly recruited also? Yes, forcibly re recruited. You see. They didn't want to get enlisted, but they were forcibly not everybody recruited. Compulsion recruited. was there, coercion was there, force was applied to come to the army. They needed, uh, of course, men. And they came because power, they required. And they were, yes. yes. Five, for instance, 5,000 criminals were released from jails and option was given to them either join army or remain in jail. And in case you join army, we will be given, you will be given these facilities and all sorts of Give things. you wages also? Yes, wages, but uh, not per month. 
your wages will be deposited at the end of my tenure released, when you come back you will you see you will your there you will be enjoy uh, say exemption from this jail term, remission they, and they, wages would be given they were given what they given so, when they came so back so such you see uh, yeah, yeah they were given yes they were given, they were given. But such soldiers as who who went there so to the what field, you're trying to argue would, is that naturally such they would soldiers inflict, you see whenever they, they the would like to uh, you know avoid uh, really yes. risking their lives yeah, and yes 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 so they they would desert fighting. they would inflict maybe some of them may have self wounds and all sorts of things then secondly there were other uh, soldiers who were uh, just say enlisted by force hmm. you see uh, around Multan and other places and. Uh, you see almost uh, yes mm. you, if you uh, see hunter commission report mm. or the commission appointed by the indian national congress mm. under the chairmanship of mahatma gandhi then they are bringing out this forced recruitment in punjab most of the people went uh, voluntarily but this proportion uh, a small proportion was there who were forced to join mm. for instance uh, they were made to stand naked before their women folk they were put in uh, sun in thorny bushes and options were given either join military or face these ordeals okay. so they joined military so there was life. lots of torture so these people who went to the army they behaved unsoldier like mm. so uh, but so indian soldiers were dedicated soldiers and they gave best account them. they showed their metal superior metal and made supreme right. sacrifices you know before the war the indian army you know whatever was there was basically for maintaining uh, you know guarding the frontiers within the country you know primarily from the afghanistan area where there was some threat maybe some other places during the war what kind of there would have also been certain internal requirement of the army so how did uh, how was this managed by uh, the british in terms of sending out the troops was it that the entire army there was no army available here how how were they deployed um, well, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, you're right. The the primary role of the Indian Army uh, before uh, the First World War was uh, was twofold. One was, of course, uh, internal security. Yes. The other was guarding the uh, frontiers of the uh, uh, of the country. Uh, and uh, in a sense, what uh, British imperial uh, uh, fears were of uh, aggression from Imperial Russia in those mm. days. Um, the the colonial authorities in india had a very uh, had a fixed formula actually that they would after 1857 mm -hmm. that they would have a certain fixed proportion of european troops for uh, to be present in in, 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 in india, india, india along with uh, a certain fixed number of indian soldiers, uh, indian soldiers. Uh, however once uh, the, uh, the war in europe broke out all they would have had to take away all the European. They, they uh, took almost the, the entire uh, lot of European regular European uh, soldiers, soldiers yeah. had to be withdrawn and rushed back to fight right. on the Western right. Front. Then they were replaced subsequently by territorial battalions, European territorial battalions, who were uh, um, uh, almost literally so it was like paramilitary forces. Uh, like paramilitary okay. forces, they were uh, civilians who had been uh, who had who basic military recruited. training, and they uh, they right. were. Uh, mobilized, called and up. They and again said, were not prepared to face, uh, you know, to uh, they uh, were they unaware about the terrain like India. Uh, yeah, and whatever. Yes, yes, absolutely. So they would have had the same kind of problems which Indian soldiers were going there and facing. Well, not really, in the no sense fighting. they were there was no fighting There's over no fighting here. There. Uh, and what uh, came as a huge relief, I mean, that was the point which we started off this discussion right. with, to the colonial authorities was the fact that uh, India as a whole uh, supported the war effort. Yes. Right. So there was very enthusiastic. So there were no mass scale rebellions or there was no sense that, you know, now that... There uh, were a few movements happening around the time when the Indian presence was there. There was the Ghadar movement going on. But it was, uh, you know, all more, fairly uh, localized, yeah. not at an all India level. The other movement was more, I mean, it was much, uh, I mean, from, uh, by the time the, it was more, I mean, uh, Gada movement was a movement which had started in the United yes, States. Yes, you know, there were some repercussions here. It did not have a very great mass impact. Nationwide impact. Plus another thing, another thing which I'd like to add here is the fact that um, uh, the British could leave the northwestern frontier of India practically unguarded during the First World War simply because Russia was an ally of Great Britain. Right. So there was no fear of a Russian, uh, no fear of a Russian invasion. Mm as uh, the great game would have had 
uh, you know, have us, uh, had the contemporaries and the other people believe in the 19, uh, from in the period 1914 mm. to 1918. No, I, I remember, you know, some part of the earlier part of the discussion, we did mention, you know, the Indian soldiers even fought in China. Now, how, no, how was China drawn into the conflict? And how did Indian soldiers land up there? Well, well the China, the, sorry. You were saying Boxer yeah. Rebellion, he was saying. No, yeah. well, after the Boxer Rebellion as well, in the, in the early stages of the war, uh, the, the Germans held uh, certain concessions in China. Okay. The port of King Dao, Qing Tao. Uh, so that's how? Uh, yes. So actually, the, there are only two battalions in the entire Commonwealth, the 36th Sikhs, which is now four Sikh, uh, four battalion, the Sikh regiment and the South Wales borders. These were the only two battalions mm. uh, which hold a battle honor for the First World War for China. Mm. Uh, they went over there and along with the Japanese, they attacked. And it would have been much easier to, to send in the Indian soldiers there because of uh, being close, closer to China. Uh, yes, I think taking all the way from e Europe. E e yes, absolutely. No I think these battalions, both these battalions were uh, maybe stationed in Hong Kong or Singapore, somewhere over there at that point in time. Right. In the 19th century, India, not only did Indian troops uh, occasionally fight in China and in Southeast Asia and in Aden and in places like, uh, you know, East Africa and so on. Wherever the British went, they used to take Indian troops along with them. But Indians, especially Sikhs and Punjabi Muslims, often uh, would be employed as guards at factories and so on. So there was a big Indian presence in uh, East Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, since the 19th century and they used to take up jobs as uh, security guards and so on. So Indian presence was always there in these parts. Hong because Kong of the presence so they were also in, in know, Pegu, Hong Kong, Malaysia, the, ter Indian the terrain and the territory was more familiar to, to Indian soldiers going there because stories would have come through the oral tradition here. Not only that, so Indians were enterprising people. I mean, we they were. I mean, Sikhs and uh, Punjabi Muslim Muslim. Well, were Indians were there in Africa. <laughs> Africa you know, for you know, a long time. Doing, so know, trade yes. from yes. Uh, people from Gujarat were, were trading in East Africa. So this was the much Indian, before, yeah, much before uh, yeah, the, yeah. the outbreak of the First World War. Yes, this is called the so Indian Ocean World, right. Indian Ocean Rim, Indian Ocean World, right. where Indians had been working, living, fighting for a very long time. So actually, this taboo about uh, you know taboo of Indians not going abroad or not crossing the seas right. is more theoretical than practical, I think. Right. We'll take another break at this stage, then come back for the final segment of our program. Even though India sent more than 1.5 million soldiers to fight the First World War, why is it that there is no memory of this? This program will continue. Be with us. Welcome back to a page from history. Prime Minister Narendra Modi recently visited the exhibition to mark the centenary of the First World War. He asked Indians to salute the sacrifice of each and every Indian soldier martyred in the war. Professor Yadav, there's this very funny dichotomy that before the centenary of the First World War started being observed, despite uh, there being the India Gate in uh, Delhi, yes. as far as public memory is concerned, somehow the other Indian participation has got erased in the last several decades. It's only there when you go out, go out in the hinterland, meet people, say, in Haryana or in Punjab or yes, other parts yes, of yes. northern India where yes. there's large-scale participation that you find that stories have survived within individual families. Right. This is not the case in the case of society. Yes, yes, yes. Why is it that you we see, have uh, not been able to make it our war yeah. too? You see, there are uh, various and varied reasons for this. But one major reason is that uh, the large body of our scholars are unfortunately not very much interested in military history. Right. In our universities, in our colleges, in our research institutions, for instance, uh, we uh, neglect military history. Mm -hmm. We are somehow not interested in, see, for instance, we are interested in freedom struggle, we are interested in political history, we are interested, now of late we have become very much interested in economic history and all that. But uh, you see, this part of uh, our history, which is equally important, mm. if not more, mm. uh, stands neglected. So this is one thing, that mm. neglect exhibits itself, manifests itself in uh, this sort of so because, memory. Because the study of, of these things get neglected by history, it disappears from yes, society. Yes, our historiography, mm. this poverty of historiography as far as military history is concerned. Mm. And uh, there is no sustained or say active interest in our universities and uh, uh, institutions let, let, let me ask to question. research. Let me bounce this idea of somebody who can actually be technically called a uh, military historian. Yes. Yes. Mm. 
why is it that uh, is it not our war? You know, why is this sense there that uh, very little awareness is there at the mass level? I am not talking about the niche level awareness. See, at one level, uh, it was our war because we participated in it. Right. And our leaders asked us to participate in right. it. Gandhi asked us to participate right. in it. Tilak asked us to participate but in it. But their understanding changed after the war. Yes. yes. And That's they right. wanted they wanted us to participate in it because they wanted us to use to learn the use of arms. Right. Which had been prohibited to us hmm. from the times of the late nineteenth century. Quite from ironical the times for of a movement which is largely going to be non violent that you know, participate in the war with enthusiasm so that you know how to use how to war. use so that you know you what it weapons. means to be manly, right. what it means to be masculine, what it means to fight, what it means to shed blood. So 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 so, said so, that. so, so, yes. so would you exactly. say yes. yes. So would you say that it was the entire purpose of participating in the war was some kind of an uh, no, you know strategy to weaponize the Indian which had uh, no, but the other thing is, yes. see, when I said it was at one level our yeah. war, but on the other side, if you right. look at his, the development of history after 1919, especially right. after the uh, Rowlett Act, Satyagraha, and after the, you know, after the mood move, turned Kilafat against movement the and then the uh, non cooperation Then movement. it did not become our war. Right. Then it became a war, uh, which was an imperialist war, right. colonial, colonial war. war, which actually did not give us the dividends, right. which it was supposed to give us. Because and they the did not even take care of the soldiers who came back. No, not at all. Because the de the demobilized so job was done. The demobilized soldiers right. were given a pittance right. as a returning allowance. The war gratuities were not really very very large. Right. All those soldiers did get cash, and there were disability pensions and widows benefited and so on and so forth. There were jungi inams and all those things. But that was not enough to satisfy the aspirations of those soldiers who were coming back with their expectations very high. Similarly, the nationalists became extremely disheartened ultimately by 1917, 1918, mm. when they realized that Britain was not in a mood to reciprocate the good with gesture on the yeah, part reciprocate of with political concessions, right. self-rule, dominion status. And this is the time the when this is the time when yes. further reforms are being considered. Yes, yes, yes. The so from our war, it becomes not our war. Right. It's from that period onwards that the historiography of the First World War is neglected in India. Right. It's off late in the last 15 years, 10 years. It's still important to, to acknowledge individual stories of valor of as course, our history. Of course, but, that, but then as, as Indians, we are negligent of history in general. Mm. So that is not only the case with history. military history, it is generally the case of history, for instance. And we are becoming more and more you know, uh, unaware, unaware un 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 of un our history. In yeah, fact, unfortunately, because Indian you need, society you need, is actually need. moving towards a place where we are having very little sense of yeah, history. Because you need, when yeah. you said, when you said we don't have memories, I mean, memories must be recorded. Right. For recording, the historian must have a certain sensibility and money. Right. So all right. those things are there. Uh, Squad Nilder China, as we get towards the concluding part of this program, you know, when we try to say that, you know, we're talking about Indian participation 100 years later on, you know, what are the most important things which you think that which need to be remembered, recalled and infused into our national consciousness at this stage? It's not enough to just have an exhibition, the Prime Minister going and, you know, sending a public message, but this has to be followed up. And this has to be followed up not just in official functions, but maybe through certain other things. As someone who has consistently tried to research this, what, you th what are your suggestions? Um, well, I do think that uh, uh, India's participation uh, in the First World War is, uh, um, is something that's um, uh, you know, worthy of, uh, um, uh, of kind of signposting mm. uh, because it has uh, um, a very s great significance for right. a resurgent India as we stand today particularly when we seek to be a player on uh, a global stage. Uh, I think we have, uh, uh, as is very apparent from this discussion, mm -hmm. uh, we have matured sufficiently as a nation. We've moved out of the colonial shadow, and uh, we can step up and reclaim mm -hmm. some aspects of our uh, history, of our past, even if they happen to be a part of a colonial past. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that uh, um, we uh, need to re-examine some of the narratives which we have taken to be 
as uh, um, true or as gospel, but are in fact you know, there, there, change, there are changes in those stories. Uh, as uh, Anirudh just pointed mm. out, we start off by uh, claiming or by um, uh, being claiming enthusiastic. It our war. Yes, and then end up know. Uh, it, you know, it being not our war. But yeah. the point is, all of that lies in the political history of British India and how uh, we engage with this conflict, I think will have a great deal of a bearing on how we will engage with the world in the years to come. So I do think there's a great deal of uh, importance of relevance um, uh, of uh, India's uh, involvement with the First World War. Just one mm -hmm. quick point I'd like to make mm -hmm. is that uh, as a result of its participation right. in the First World War, India was uh, signatory of the Treaty of Versailles. Right. It was a part of the uh, Paris Peace Conference. Mm -hmm. It subsequently became one of the founding members of the League of Nations and was uh, later, as a result, direct result of this, one of the founding members of the United Nations. Right. India arrived on the international arena as a national entity, right. even though it was still a colony of the British Empire because of World War I. I think that's a very important mm -hmm. point, and on this note, I think it's uh, time for me to wind up this program. We could have discussed this much longer. We also have to understand that the, the First World War actually triggered the entire change in the narrative of the national movement. Uh, we have talked about it at length also in the course of the program. Thank you very much for coming and joining me on this program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In one of the numerous records that remain of the First World War, an Indian soldier, Mal Singh, recorded his story. He said, there was once a man who used to eat butter in his native Hindustan. This man then came to the European War and Germany captured him. He said that this man wished to return to India. If he goes back, he hoped that Hindustan, he'll again be able to get the same food. Now, we do not know whether this Mal Singh ever returned to India or not, but many did. Mutilated, traumatized, but also at times more confident, secure, and worldly wise. It is this soldier who eventually infused in the Indian masses the awareness to fight for their rights and freedom. 